Cash can get guarded. Are you ready, John? Good to go. Very good. Good morning, everybody. It is Friday, February 11th. This is the third installment in this series that I call One Lesson. And I'm going to explain that for just a moment before we get into it. And I wish I could have retitled it something different, but we're too late. I'm just going to keep it one lesson. And what I've asked my speakers to do is give us one lesson, not the one lesson, but one lesson that they would give to a potential convert, somebody who's interested in the gospel, to maybe whet their appetite to want more, or something along those lines. They just don't know much about the Bible. They may know something, but they want to know more. What's one lesson you would give? And most of my speakers say, well, I have several. I don't know which way you want to go, and it's hard, because this is sort of a phantom audience, and I'll be the audience today. And uh, But this will give anybody, our target audience has been Christians who want to teach. They want to teach others, but don't know how, don't even know where to start. We've had Andy Cantrell, we've had Scott Beyer, who gave us great insights. And today we have Brother John Kilgore from the Houston, Texas area. And uh, him and I are no strangers to each other, but he's agreed to share with us one of his lessons that will accomplish what our goal is. And last couple of times, John, we've had between 500 to 700 viewers. So there's an audience for this. And I'm uh, happy for that. And I'm glad we're, we talked a lot about it last week at lectures. People were tuning into this that I had no idea. So there's an audience for this. And this is going to be good. So let me start off with a word of prayer. And if you want to get your Bibles open, we're going to go to Matthew chapter 4 to start in just a moment. I'll start us off with a prayer. And then I'll turn it over to John to let us know what his one of his lessons would be. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, it's good that we can be here today. We thank you so much again for the opportunity. We thank you so much for the means of the internet. We know it can be used for bad, but we try to use these for good. We pray that we are good stewards of the blessings you give us, including the way we communicate to each other and how we communicate to each other. We pray that we can reach a good audience. We pray for wisdom as we look for ways to sharpen our skills when we talk to people who are interested in your word. Help us to be reasonable and approachable and speaking the truth in a spirit of love. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, John, I'm going to let you take over and I'll just follow your lead here if that's okay. All right. Delighted to be with you, Jeff, and all of your audience. And we pray, God, that it will be used for good. Well, yes, one lesson. Really, Jeff, I like the title. I think I think you make no apology for it. I like it. Now, of course, I would interpret it this way. If I only have one lesson that I think I'll be able to give to a person who's not a Christian, I likely would select this one. And uh, recognizing there are many ways, of, as there are varieties of people and where they stand and how much they know the Bible and what their religious background is, all of that would dictate that you go in a different direction. But generally speaking, <clears throat> I have come in my preaching and teaching life to settle on this one. And I'd like to tell you why. Early in my teaching, you know, I emphasized teaching people what, what they had to do in order to be saved or what must I do to become a Christian. And of course, those lessons, our lessons, are very important. No one becomes a Christian without learning how to become a Christian. And we're very familiar with that process of teaching people to, to get it from the scriptures here, believe Jesus and accept him as the Christ the Savior, to repent of sins and to be baptized. Yes, it, that must be taught. But I began to think that, and I began to witness people that I had taught who received it rather early or quickly, and even those who, with whom we studied for a good while, um, they didn't seem to have an understanding of who they were to become. And so I began to think more about 
introducing people and approaching them, especially at the start, with who is a Christian? What kind of person are they? Uh, and, and I also ask myself this question. How did Jesus do this? I mean, Jesus had a real uh, reformation, really reclamation project coming into Jewish society that had become so corrupt and off the beat, missing the point that he had to approach people and get them back <clears throat> to understanding who a child of God, how, the, how they act. What are their attitudes? So I settled on the eight statements by Jesus in Matthew chapter five called the Beatitudes, because I believe that this is the most concise, not the only, but the most concise presentation of who a Christian is, who a Christian is, one who believes that Jesus of Nazareth is the Messiah or the Christ, the King. He is the King in the kingdom. So with that stated, let's go and look for a moment at these eight Beatitudes that describe to us who a Christian is. And then later, I think it sets you, us up for a conversation uh, at another time, obviously, with this person that we want to teach of how do I become that person? How do I get started? Mm -hmm. Well, this is trying to find out where they are in regard to just basic um, characteristics of a Christian. All right, mm -hmm. let's begin in chapter 4, verse 23. And... Uh, Jeff, I'm going to treat you just like I would a student that, you know, that has a very little, relatively little knowledge. Of, well, either way, I would go either way, but this is especially good for people who have not had much exposure to the Bible, and I'll treat you as a student. So I'm going to ask you to read chapter 4, verse 23. Thank you, John. And before I do, I'm going to say one of the things that I had in mind was myself. Never unchurched. Is that a word? That's what I grew yeah. up in. Never had a Bible in the house. Especially now. Yeah. Well, there are a lot of unchurched people now, more right. than ever before in our history. Do you realize that just recently the dem demographers established or determined that for the first time since this particular survey had been taken, it has been decades, we have more people not going to church than we do going to church. Mm -hmm. It's unprecedented in my life. If you don't know that, just look at the culture and the statistics of crime and other things, I would say. But anyway, no, I had myself in mind. I was didn't grew up in the church, no Bible in the house, parents not Christians. I had a good, comfortable growing up. But uh, when I was 23, I read the Bible for the first time. And I was very confused and overwhelmed of where to start because I did try to start in Genesis because that's where you start every book, right? In the beginning. Sure. And you get to Leviticus, and I think, what in the world have I got myself into? And then I got some proper guidance. So that's what this is. So thank you for using me as your target audience, which was realistically me about 25 years ago. So this is what we need to keep in mind. Okay, thank you. Ephesians 4, I'm sorry, Matthew 4, verse 23. And he went throughout all Galilee and their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction among the people. All right, what was he teaching and preaching, Jeff? He was teaching in their synagogues, the kingdom of the gospel. Oh, the, the good news, the, the gospel of the kingdom, the kingdom. Now, we understand that gospel means the good news. But let me ask you this, what do we have to have to have a kingdom? You got to have at least two things. What are they? I would say some sort of ruler, some king. sort of territory. I have a king. And some sort of territory. Ah, good answer, but it's not exactly precise. Not what you're looking for. Okay. <laughs> well, no, in, in biblical terms. Yeah. It, it, yes, it's not what I'm looking for, but, <laughs> but this is a very, very, very common uh, misconception. Yes. In order to have a kingdom, you've got to have a king and you've got to have a dom, a D-O-M, 
a dominion. Now, often we think dominion as territory because that's the way the physical world works. But the dominion of God has always been people. People, the rule over people, the hearts and minds of people. And here, the good news of a king to reign over us, our people, dominion. And so I think it would help us a lot in our study of the kingdom. And I made fairly extensive search of kingdom. How often it does in the scriptures as well relate to territory or area, physical boundaries, et cetera, of course. But in spiritual terms, it's talking about the people over whom this person rules as king. Now, let me ask you this, Jeff. Normally speaking, do we normally think of somebody ruling over us as good news? Not necessarily. We like our freedoms. I like to not be told what to do. Thank you very much. Yeah. And that's the problem. Will he be despotic? Will he be autocratic? Will he allow us any freedom? Will he abuse us? You see, you know, and we're Americans. I mean, we fought a revolution to get rid of a king. And I'm a Texan. And we fought another one to, to get rid of a, of a ruler. I mean, some of us that got a double whammy of being independent, we'll take care of it ourselves. And for those of you that know anything about Texas and Texans, uh, we, we have kind of a double uh, uh, dose of that, sometimes to, oftentimes to our detriment. But here you have it. We're afraid. But this is good news. Good news of the kingdom. In other words, this ruler is someone we need. This ruler is someone who will do precisely the right thing beyond our ability to know and about, uh, beyond our ability to even decide for ourselves. But no, we've already introduced a very key factor. There are a lot of people who don't want to ever be told that somebody else can rule their lives better than they can. Mm -hmm. They're not open to that. Mm -hmm. You can't be a Christian if you're not open to that idea. If you don't sense that you need help. All right, let's read a little bit more. All right, read 24 through 25. Before I do, John, might be asking if I'm asking this, um, if I'm resistant on that idea, I don't want somebody telling me what to do. What's something you might say to that person? I might suggest, look at life. There's always authority. There's always an authority figure in anything and everything we do. Is that a good example? Is that a good way to handle that? Do you think? In other words, I don't want authority, but Hey, listen, there's authority in families and companies and clubs and everything you do, traffic laws, everything we do. How far is this a stretch to suggest that we need to, I mean, I'm going to use the word submit to authority. We don't like that language, but that's in essence what it is. Is it not? Well, I think that's a good line of reasoning. What comes to my mind in response to your question is, if you're really sick, you're willing to submit to the authority of trained professional doctors. It's a great way to be out. If that's if it's important to you, then you look for the professionals. Uh, there we go. There we you go. know, in other words, in areas that you don't have any expertise, right? You right. don't know. You don't know. You recognize, in other words, we want authority when we begin to recognize our limitations. It's true. And that is so key in teaching a person about Christ. He helps us become more self-aware of our limits. That's, you know, that's Go ahead. That's a great point, John. I, maybe that's a better way to put it. The better way to put it is how many times have we seen young people want to be a better singer, a better athlete, then they take an interest in something. So they be, they go take lessons from somebody who's a trained expert in something data. It's important to them, 
So now they're going to do something about it. And what we're hoping and praying for is somebody is thinking about their spiritual condition and they want to do something about it. So that's maybe the better analogy, perhaps. Better Let me just sow a little seed. When we become self-aware of our weaknesses, mm -hmm. our failings, our failures, we're going to be interested in somebody who helps us overcome them. Now we're going to look for answers. Very good. Yes, okay. Exactly. Thank That's you. going to be good news. Mm -hmm. And, well, you could illustrate it in many, many, many ways. Often, this is how the autocrat or the person who abuses other people gets a foothold. He works right. among people who are in poverty of one form or another and offers them what they've always wanted to hear. Test Jesus on that level. Right. Does he always tell people what they want to hear? Is he manipulating people like so many uh, powerful uh, men and women use? Test him. I right. suggest to you, he does not. He is right. always truth in advertising. All right. Very Let's good. Read 24 25. Yes, sir. Matthew 4, verse 24 and 25. So his fame spread throughout all Syria, and they brought him all the sick, those afflicted with various diseases and pains, those oppressed by demons, epileptics and paralytics, and he healed them. And great crowds followed him from Galilee and the Dec Decapolis, the Decapolis, and from Jerusalem and Judea and from beyond the Jordan. All right. What gives Jesus credibility? in his teaching and preaching. Why would, why do people listen to him, Jeff? You look at the audience here, and they were looking for healing of all the diseases and affliction. Seems like he had something to say about that and maybe something to do about that. Yeah, and, and it's an illustration of people who are very self-aware of their limitations, of what, of, of what they, you know, what they don't have. You know, they need. They need healing. And also, note he throws in there, in addition to uh, those who were ill, suffering with various diseases, pain, but demoniacs, people are demon-possessed. And epileptics, which sometimes uh, in the first century were signs of demon possession. Uh, we have a case of that where a person is out of control flailing about in epilepsy and paralytic sometimes they also that is a, a symptom of demon possession well he healed him so he's demonstrating he can meet he has power that other people don't have and he has power to meet the needs of these people now would also i like to also tie that where do those kinds of things come from I believe they come from the first, where well, they're chronicled in the first chapters of Genesis with sin, with the devil, that the earth becomes cursed. And we could, maybe we'll, people want to argue about that, but that's where I think creation becomes out of, <clears throat> out of sync, which ultimately produces these things. And also at this time, the devil was given more freer, freer reign and I believe he is now, to afflict people in this way. But the main point I just try to make is, here are people with, they're self-aware of their limitations, and he, they're coming to Jesus, and he is curing or, or curing that which they need. Mm -hmm. Therefore, they're listening to him, even to the point that large crowds followed him from Galilee and the Decapolis, in Jerusalem, Judea, even from beyond the Jordan. In other words, they're coming. But note, just a historical note, not many will become disciples. Mm -hmm. And that is all this attention. Well, why? There's a winnowing process. People come to religious leaders or churches for all kinds of reasons. If they will talk to us as teachers for several different reasons. And so we need to help them to see what Jesus really offers and what he does not. 
All right. Very good. Now, let's go and read five, chapter 5, 1 and 2. Matthew 5, 1 and 2. Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying... All right, so we pause here. It's kind of a dramatic way of saying it. He sat down, and then he opens his mouth, and then he teaches them. I almost think this is the way that Matthew is getting our attention. In other words, how else can you speak other than opening your mouth? So why mention it? It's almost like a radio a person who is chronically in now. He sits down and his disciples gathered to him. And now he opening his mouth, he says, and that way. But who comes and sits close to him? His disciples. All right. Let's work on that word just a bit. The people that we will teach likely will not have a very clear understanding of what a, who a disciple is and what that word means. We get a little clue if you look at the root of the word disciples comes to English in various, that's kind of a root, comes into English in our English word pupil. And pupil describes who, Jeff? Somebody who's a student, somebody who's student. in the classroom. Right? Student's a great synonym. Mm -hmm. a student. First of all, Jeff, do you want to be a student of what Jesus is saying? I do, but you're right. That's what, that's what the, that's the uh, that's the target audience exactly. And to be a student, you have to be a learner. That's what it means, a learner, somebody who recognizes they don't know everything, especially about the particular topic. If they want to learn, they are a learner, but. A disciple is more than a learner. You know, we send our kids to a public school. Many still do. Many don't for exactly this reason. We want them to be learners, but do we want them to be disciples of those teachings? Yes or no? It just depends on the context, I guess, right? The kind of school, what they're teaching, what they're pushing. Yeah. In other words, the word disciple is more than a learner. That person is a follower. True. A learner who follows and a follower who learns. Now, I've kind of used that phrase to help people. And I try to put it in their mind because they're going to need it the rest of their life. A disciple is a learner who follows and a follower who learns because you never it's it, what's the process you learn you follow but you're going to meet a situation you don't know what to do what do the scriptures teach on that subject i don't know what to believe or, or what i should do so i got to go back and learn and then we'll follow and then we'll have to add in following experiences are going to test your knowledge. Does your knowledge meet the situation? You know, and there's much that can be gained through counseling others who are further down the road than we are. Well, that's learning and following and following to learn. So I'm going to ask you to say it. A disciple is a learner who follows and a follower who learns you with me i so, am a disciple is a is a learner who follows and a follower who learns exactly and if you ever stop you've quit being an active disciple and you are in danger of losing the master losing his approval right. and comfort all right with that in mind so he's talking to his disciples but we need to quickly add, it's not just disciples who are there. Turn to the end of the sermon in chapter 7 and read for me. Uh, 
Miami. Here we go. 28 and 29 of chapter 7. Yep. Matthew 7, 28, 29. And when Jesus finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one who had authority and not as their scribes. All right. So the crowds are there. They're hearing. The disciples are close. They came to him. He's addressing them, but the crowds are there too. I mean, Jesus would be talking to all of us and all of them. All right, so back to chapter five. Now, the next, I'm going to give you an outline of a way to kind of put this together. <clears throat> All right, who is a kingdom person? Who is the person who accepts Jesus as the ruler of the king of their life and becomes his disciple? Again, a learner who follows and a follower who learns. Who is that? What does it look like? All right. And I want to give you three one, three one. Three needs. I need to do it this way. You know, arthritis is limited by ability. Hold up. Not the Trinity. This is your version of the Trinity, huh? Okay. I, I tried to get that. <laughs> Everybody laughs. I keep forgetting in my preaching, but you know, when you get old, a lot of people take pity on you, just like you did at Camp Jeff. Yes. <laughs> never. No, no, never. But at any rate, so three, one, three, one. And the first three are needs. And then we have a summary. And then the next three are, if you will, results that come from those needs being met. And then the final one if you will, is preparing us for the future of a, a disciple. Okay. All right. So let's begin by reading verse three. And now we're going to got to look at it in a whole first. Verse three and verse 10. Read verse three and then read verse 10. Okay. Matthew 5, verse three. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Verse 10. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. All right. Other than blessed or blessed, what is the common phrase in both of those verses? Blessed are theirs, for theirs is? Uh, is the? Kingdom of heaven. Yeah. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The first beatitude says, to these belong the rule of Jesus Christ, who is ruling. He's come from heaven to rule over us. Mm -hmm. it's spiritual rule, its rule originated in heaven. It has now come to earth on a mission to attract people who will be its subjects, to form a kingdom. They will become the dom, his dominion over the hearts and minds of those who accept it. All right? He begins that way. He ends that way. That yields the conclusion. This is what it's about. Mm -hmm. It's about the rule of Jesus as king. Now, Jeff, do you have any sense of needing a king, a ruler in your life? <laughs> I'm my own king. Thank you very much. And if somebody... Right. It gets to the point when you need the... Yeah, I, if someone will say, well, you know, I'm kind of doing pretty good by myself. I'm my own king. I said, you know, that is a common situation. And I've been there too. Yeah. But Jeff, if you ever been in such circumstances, situations where you just didn't know what to do. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Because, yeah, if yeah. you faced your limitations where you need to rely upon something or someone other than yourself. Mm -hmm. That's what it's I'm not talking. easy. Exactly. It's the exasperation. And the irony is we try to iron things out. We try to get everything settled out and we pray for the smooth ways in life. But it's those difficult times in life that draw us to the gospel. It's those uh, awakening moments. It's the, that's just one of those ironies of life. We do all we can to get it in control. And when things get out of control, you can flip out and have an anxiety attack. Or you can say, I need to turn it over to somebody who can take control of this. 
and give me that contentment that I need. Now, here, we need to kind of think about the people who are likely willing to sit down with us, usually one-on-one now, more than in sermons, it appears, and have this kind of conversation. And our responsibility is people who love them, <clears throat> who have been exposed likely to the gospel in a way that they have not, we have been afforded the privilege, the privilege of offering to someone, not by our authority, not by our own merit, certainly, an opportunity to get to know the king of the world who will help them immeasurably change their life. Likely, they're not even aware of that. They don't possibly even see how much they need him. And so our job is to the best of our ability to gently show them their limitations. This is why we always have to be willing to preach and teach the law. The law condemns us. It shows us where we've gone wrong. The law helps us to see how we're out of sync with the God of the universe, and certainly with his son. And his son came to put us in harmony so that we can live the full life. So with that in mind, uh, Jeff, we're going to, uh, first of all, Jesus here is going to show us both. Three statements that describe our needs. It, but I like to put it this way. I think it was John R. W. Stott or one of the commentators um, I've read in his book or something. The trinity of needs. This is what will drive us to accept the good news of the king. All right, so let's begin with the first one. Verse three. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, what does it mean to be poor in spirit? That sounds like a real negative. How can we be blessed if we're in poverty? And that is our word, poor. Poor is a relative term, meaning you have to understand the things that are being compared one to another. If I'm being compared to the billionaires of this world, I'm poor. But I'm certainly not poor being compared, let's say, to the people that are the poorest of our world. And neither are you and neither are most of us or many of us. But who are the persons being compared? I believe you're comparing yourself to the God of the universe to the creator God, do you sense that you're in poverty? You don't have anything of real value or that will really deliver or give you what you need. It's an expression of abject neediness, the kind that caused people on Pentecost to cry out, men and brethren, what shall we do? Look what we've done. We killed the Christ, the Messiah. How can we, what can we do? And quite honestly, for all who are listening, brethren, do not rob the people that you are teaching the opportunity to experience guilt and spiritual pain. Don't rob them of the opportunity to truly face who they are and how they've lived and why they need Jesus. And I fear that I've done that at times in the past, just teach them so we can baptize them. And this is especially doing all these many years of, and Jeff, you're very well aware of this, having done a lot of the work with the young people at camp and summer camps as well. It is so easy to do to a young person. You can teach them what to do to be saved. They know it often better than we do, as far as quoting it. 
But that doesn't mean that they feel a deep sense of guilt and poverty, that they need to be forgiven. I've learned over these many years of doing that work to ask them, I said, um, to Camper, I said, are you a sinner? And I've had some of the youngest say, well, well no. Why? Well, they've been, they've been brought up by Christian parents you know, they've lied or maybe they took something they shouldn't, They, you know, and they feel guilty about that, but they don't see themselves as a sinner. Well, Jesus is a doctor. He's looking for sick people. Mm -hmm. We just need to wait. So don't rush them or rob them of the agony of repentance, changing the mind. That leads to a change of life. So, at any rate, here we are. This is what would be a synonym, do you think, for poor in spirit, Jeff? I've always used humility. Exactly. Humility. Humility is the basic virtue. Note, Jesus said, This is first. Realizing that God is God and I am not. And that's not an easy thing to come to terms with, I think. And especially if you're dealing with, uh, you know, uh, an adult of many years, maybe a very accomplished person who's excelled in their field and risen to some position of power and prestige. Do they feel, are they humble? Right. And all of us who are disciples, remember? Learner who follows a follower who learns. Continual, right? Perpetual. Yeah. Creatures. Mm -hmm. I was just thinking, you know, as a side note, the danger here is, you know, I, Paul's a great example of humility, being poor in spirit, because he was able to get a following and he says, like, I'm not doing this to get an audience for me. I'm doing this to the glory of God. And he could have been pretty successful. I'm happy that you're sending me money. I don't need the money. I'm happy for you to have the opportunity to send me the money. But the danger for preachers like you and me and others, you get all the accolades and I'm going to teach you to be a disciple of what? The temptation can be for the teacher without the humility to be a disciple of me. All of a sudden I have a following. Look how many people I baptize and look at my church that I'm now at. There's a big, big danger there, and you need to keep that humility in check. And I'm ever so thankful now for the thorns in my flesh that remind me of my dependence on God. Otherwise, our our head's going to get too big, and the crown's not going to fit anymore. It's going to squeeze right off. Very good. So blessed are the humble. That's where we yes. all start. It, it, conversely, pride is the basic sin. Mm -hmm. It makes not only is it a sin, but it makes every other sin worse. So we start with humility. So let's see, what do humble people do? Read verse four, please. Blessed are those who mourn, they shall be comforted. Now, what do you think they're mourning? Mourning means weeping, crying. I mean, we're, we're in pain, spiritual, emotional pain. What do like you Yeah. If in this context, I would think spiritual, and I would realize again, I'm God, I'm not God, and God is, but I have fallen short, and I need that Savior. I need something to bridge the gap of look where my decisions have gotten me. I'm unfulfilled, I'm I, I lack meaning, I need more, and I'm humbled by that. That I have just sort of exasperated that I've put everything into the world or into self, and I'm I'm falling up short all the time, yes. Uh, that's precisely it. You know, uh, I've read sources that indicate, well, this is really where we're we're reaching out <clears throat> to the poor of the world who are mourning for the fact that they don't have food, they don't have this, no, that misses the point. No, they're mourning for sin. They're mourning over sin, for they shall be comforted. A broken heart, might put it that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Again, depending on how well we know the person that we are studying with, 
there may be some time to go into some specifics. You know, we're having to teach people, um, younger people, certainly younger than I am, um, that shack, we call it shacking up together is fornication. That's not what you do in your love life, in your romantic life. You don't do it for economics. You don't do it for whatever other reason, for sexual gratification. Tax breaks. I've heard of that. <laughs> right. Uh, you honor the sanctity of marriage the way God arranged it. Well, the pe young, people of our culture, many of them don't. I mean, I just can almost remember, well, not almost, I do remember vividly realizing this person is, they don't know the word fornication. They even know what it means because it's not the way our world thinks anymore. And we could go down to the litany of the various ills that are afflicting our society more and more. We have to help people to understand that the God of heaven has a strong, strong, not only opinion, but has commanded and a warning about these things. And we're out of sync with him. And we need to be mourning that. And humble people do. Because humble people recognize the supremacy and authority of the creator God. So, now um, you asked, sorry, John, you asked me a question and I answered it the wrong way, I think, because I'm trying to pretend I'm the audience here. And you asked me what humility is. And I gave you an answer that is this side of conversion. But as a person 25 years ago off the street, I might suggest a humble person is a person of humble means, somebody in a third world country, somebody who's lacking job, that type of thing. And I don't think that would be a necessarily wrong answer to the question of what is humility. But I answered it with the context of I need to think spirit. That's the answer you gave too. I just want to point that out that, um, and this is hard in a discussion like this, I understand, but somebody brand new, this person doesn't know. Uh, what is grace? Grace is uh, something you say for a prayer before a meal. Well, that's true, but pray, you know, let's talk about what grace defined in scripture is, and that's where we're going with this. So. These are wonderful opportunities. Exactly. People don't know. Right. They don't. If so, it's an opportunity to say, well, okay, let's think about that. Right. Very good. Hey, Jesus, was he a, a, a humble person? Yes. Well, he was God in the flesh. Mm-hmm. No greater person be yet humble and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. All right. Now let's now go to the third in verse five. Verse five, blessed are the meek, they shall inherit the earth. All right. So what do humble mourning for sin people want changed in their life? What Inclinations have gotten out of control. What things are uh, addictions? And all sin is addictive in that sense. But what strong urges or whatever that need to be under control? And we have two words in our English translations. We have meek, which often in our culture we think is weak. Mm -hmm. Nothing could be further from the truth, as hopefully we'll see. Other translations use the word gentle. Mm -hmm. And it's apt. Uh, gentle. What do you have to do to gentle a horse? You may not be a horse person, Jeff, but. City dweller from Los Angeles and me did this never. So, uh, yeah, you have, to, you have to train a horse. You have to break a horse, I think is the term. Yeah. Watch the number. To know, I mean, I've been yeah. so old. I've ridden a horse a couple of times. Uh, to tame a wild horse, you have to break them to the bridle and the saddle. Yeah, Which are instruments noted, instruments of control. Someone else now can control us or control that animal, not break the spirit of that animal but put their power under control. Being gentle 
are meek is being under the controlling power of God to accomplish great things. Now, what are some things in your life, Jeff, that you see you need to get under control? Confession time? Yeah. Great. Outburst of anger at times, pride. Uh, anger. anger. People cut me off in traffic. I don't care for that very much. I want to get those types of things. Others could be lust of the flesh. Right. The lust of the eye, wanting pretty things and being attracted to all the glitzy stuff of life in all forms. Mm -hmm. Greed, envy, jealousy, the pride of life, which often produces it makes worse all these things. Wanting to think well of yourself overly. Well, God promises that if we'll allow him, if the king promises <clears throat> allow him to be king, ruler, and obey him, he'll help us bring those under control. And mm -hmm. then we'll become powerful instruments to bless our lives and to bless others. So look, we've looked at three needs. The need for humility, the need for a mournful spirit in regard to sin, and the need to get our lives under control. That's what Jesus is offering. That's why he calls it blessed or blessed. Those who will allow him to be the king of these areas. And then he's going to summarize all three of these needs by our next beatitude. All right, read verse eight. I'm sorry, I went too far. Read verse set, uh, uh, six. I'll get it right. Read Sorry, verse seven. Five and verse six. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. They shall be satisfied. All right. Now, if you ever been really hungry or really thirsty? Not very much, but I have an idea. You miss a meal, yeah, you start getting the hunger pains. A little ridiculous, but yes, yeah. I've never been what I would say just hungry. I mean, severely, but thirsty, yes. It was through artificial, not artificial, but it was, I was going into surgery and the energy injected me with some chemical that dried up all the moisture in my body to, uh, I think, hold down bleeding or whatever. And I woke up with a burning thirst. I just, just needed some water. And they gave me ice cubes, you know, to suck on. And, but it, these are two metaphors to indicate extreme strong desire. And what, for what? To do something about your broken spirit. Yeah. He puts a phrase, hunger and thirst for what? Righteousness. Righteousness. Doing the right thing. Yeah. Be right with God. That has to motivate our lives all the time. We just want to do what's right. We want to believe what's right. We want to do what's right. In order to believe what's right, we've got to go to the appropriate sources and the originators of truth, which can only be God, mm -hmm. to go to his word. And that's why we got to be in the book and stay in the book for the rest of our lives, because we hunger and thirst for righteousness. And it isn't just learning it. Remember, a disciple is one who learns, who follows. A learner who follows and a follower, a doer who learns. So not only learning what's right, but doing it. Mm -hmm. That's the core of your life as a Christian. And now let's go to three things that come as a result. <clears throat> Remember what the promise is? Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be what? Satisfied. Satisfied or filled. And in other words, satisfied. 
filled, filled full. And with that filled full satisfied, look what comes. Three things come. Let's see them. Look at verse seven now. Blessed are merciful, they shall receive mercy. We can become merciful. And note who he's talking to. He's talking to us. We can become merciful. We can extend mercy in order to receive mercy. Now, let's talk about mercy. Mercy is a word that is used in the interchange between two unequal things. In other words, for me to be merciful to you, Jeff, I have to not only know what you need, but I have to have the power to give it. In other words, what do you need that I have? Or let's put it on you. What do you have that other people need? I'm not sure I followed, John. I'm sorry. What do I need? Uh, in order to be merciful, okay. there has to be an unequal relationship between the giver and the receiver. Okay. It's not merciful to have two equal parties who say, you know, you and I are in a transaction and you agree to give me a thousand dollars for this coat I'm wearing and I give you the coat and you give me the thousand dollars. Has anybody been merciful? No. Mm -hmm. Right. No. Merciful only occurs when there's an inequality. Got it. Where the giver has something that the receiver does <clears throat> not have. Mm -hmm. So what do you have as a giver that other people need? I, I guess I'm thinking of forgiveness and how I need to forgive people and how God forgives me. And, and it's not equaling things so much, but it does say, forgive us our debts as we, those types of language used in the next chapter. And yeah, there's an inequality that that's the way, that's a good way to look at it. But there is a, an extension of forgiveness that's offered. Now, also, it not only may be forgiveness, we have sinned against a brother or sister, but also they need our financial resources. We have them, they don't. What right. does the Bible teach us? Give it to them. Right. Relieve them, especially if they're in the family and they have first dibs on our resources. And financial is the gospel. We know the gospel. For people that don't know it, it is merciful to tell them. Mm -hmm. We and on and on we can go. I think more important would be time, perhaps. Of Give course. them more time. time. I would be generous or merciful with my time. Otherwise, I could be home watching my favorite movies staring at my screen, doing whatever, but I need to be merciful with my time. Okay, I, I follow where you're going yeah. with that. And, and what about your ability? Mm -hmm. I, mean, ability. Right. I mean, I've known people with immense musical talent and they, they, they're they unwilling to share it like with others in congregational worship. Mm -hmm. they, they don't sing. They don't agree to learn to lead others in congregational singing. They could. I mean, they're in bands, they're in choirs. You know, they could do all that. And often people with much less talent, native talent, are called upon to do why they're willing. They're mm -hmm. willing to care. They're merciful toward the situation of providing what is needed. And on and on you can go. Christians want to give away everything that God has given them. God has been merciful to us. Let us be merciful to others. Christians are givers. Remember the statement that Paul reminds us that Jesus said, it's more blessed to give than to receive. Yeah. 
think many of us said, well, I think receiving is good enough. God, we stop there. Some reason I was thinking only in terms of forgiveness, forgiving of people that are that need forgiveness, which I love to give because it's been given to me. But yeah, there's you extended that a little better. That's I appreciate you doing that. Thank you. Yeah. That's a, that's a merciful person. You're looking for people to help the need. You know. Mm-hmm. All right. Now that's what we're able to do. And note who usually is really given or gets that message and acts on it. It's humble people. Mm -hmm. Humble people are quick to be merciful Mm -hmm. toward others. All right, then let's go to verse eight. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. All right, now we have a choice here. Purity is used in at least two ways, maybe more, but at least two main ways in scripture. Purity can be Uh, the opposite of sinfulness or of uncleanness. Uh, Purity, uh, therefore, purity of life is a clean life. And certainly that is so. A Christian is pure in that sense. They've been forgiven and they pursue a life that wants to seek righteousness. They want to be right. So therefore, they're clean, spiritually clean in that sense. But I think that the second way is more to the point, at least it appeals to me, that is purity in regard to commitment. We say pure gold. What do we mean? Well, it's all gold. To have a pure heart, devoted, devotion, 100%. Purity in that sense, not of divided allegiance and loyalty, divided mind, purely into it all. And he says, go ahead and read it. Pure, I'll read it again. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. I tend to think that even though we're not emphasizing the results of each of these statements, which is Another great lesson, but see God, see God in nature. You know, when we are able to look with spiritual eyes, devoted hearts that produce the ability to see God and what he has done, we marvel at creation. We marvel at people and the joy of that creation and the opportunity to share the gospel pure in heart and then goes along with the rest of the sermon chapter 6 24 divided loyalties like you said everything else very good very good okay all right Sorry. go to then verse 9 chapter 5 verse 9 blessed are the peacemakers they shall be called sons of god yeah call sons of god meaning they'll call sons of god because they are sons of god his children. They're his children. They're like him. Remember, son of is a Hebraism, son of the devil, son of darkness, children of light. All those are Hebraisms meaning alike. Their children are like their father if they're of true parentage. And so here, blessed are those who, I'm sorry, blessed are the peacemakers. So we get to be a peacemaker. Well, who is a peacemaker? Well, literally, someone who makes peace. Question. Who do you want to walk into a tense and troubled, warring situation between two powerful forces? Tell you, I think I want a gentle, meek person. Somebody who is under the control of God. You don't want a hot head. You don't want a person who's given to anger. You don't want a person who's given to running off with premonitions or instant conclusions or assumptions. You want somebody who's calm and steady and stays calm and steady and really gets to the bottom of those issues. Those are the people that can help 
brethren come together. As a newbie, I might see it now. A person who's humble, somebody who's seeking righteousness, would want a cooler head to come in and try to help be a solution to the problem. Yeah. If you have no interest in those things, what you want is somebody to come in who's on your side to humiliate somebody who's not on your side. And that does not solve any problems. That makes you feel good for a moment. That's the passing pleasures of sin and satisfaction. But it does go to the heart of the question of what kind of person do you want to be? You see the bigger picture here, perhaps. Yeah. What kind of person are you becoming? There we go. You want to be right or you want to win? Right. Want to win the argument. You want to be lifted up. I was right. You were wrong. How are you doing on humility? Mm -hmm. right. Like I, right. You know, one of the most humble people in the world. Only my great humility prevents me from telling you how great I really am. Mm -hmm. A friend of mine gave me that slogan. I put it up in my bathroom. She did that to punch me a little bit, but maybe she thought I needed it. I was young. Only my great humility prevents me from telling you how great I really am. <laughs> I might think it, but I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> and uh, Jeff, you know the person who would give that to me. Absolutely. Yep. First name is Peggy. Absolutely. Yep. I would uh, expect that from her. I would be disappointed exactly. if she didn't do that. <laughs> so, and now, how is the world going to treat this marvelous, blessed person? Let's read verse 10. Blessed are those who persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Really? I am blessed if I'm persecuted for righteousness sake. Yeah. Why? Because it begins to authenticate that I am truly a Christian. You know, a person who has never never suffers any persecution, any opposition, any blowback or criticism you're either hiding in the cellar or hiding you're never letting people know that you're a christian which is a contradiction in terms right there then why why does the world persecute christians jeff a lot of reasons i think in a very succinct way is the light is a little too bright for their darkness but you can word it and expound a lot of ways on that darkness does not want to be exposed to light it runs from the light and if you're living the light meaning you're seeking after righteousness and you want to live in the light darkness doesn't want you it could be as innocuous as leaving your house every Sunday morning and Wednesday night and your neighbors see that and that makes them feel guilty. It could be something like that, that, okay, I don't like that person because it reminds me of maybe what I should be doing or there's some condemnation there that is assumed or something along those lines. But it, it, and that's just, that's minimal. Uh, yeah. Well, drunks don't want to be in the company of people who don't drink. They want, yeah. People who are cursing and using foul language all the time don't like to be around people who they know oppose it mm -hmm. and don't use it. Mm -hmm. Even maybe are willing to be brave enough to ask them not to speak in that way. People who are dishonest and are cheating on their time card or on their taxes or in their or on their mates are not comfortable being around people who are open and above board and are striving to be thoroughly honest. And so they're going to lash out. They're going to either by innuendo or 
unspoken words or actions or whatever. They're going to oppose it. Mm -hmm. so Jesus is truth in advertising. You need to get ready for it. It's going to happen. No, but he continues the blessing. Read verses 11 and 12. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad for your reward is great in heaven for, the, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. All right, but no, they're persecuted for the sake of righteousness or for my name's sake, not for being a jerk, not for being unwise, but for the right reason. And he, he gives two reasons why they are blessed. You're blessed because of why? Look for it. So I was writing it down about we're not being persecuted for being a jerk. That's a great line. So got you. Great. That was great. So they're going to persecute you. And, and I'm sorry, what's the question? Sorry. <laughs> look, look at verse 12. He gives you two reasons to be rejoicing. Your reward in heaven is great. All and right. put you in good company with the prophets who were before you. One, you're going to be greatly rewarded, and you're in great company. Be joined with all the great men and women of old. Yeah. You're in good company. Mm -hmm. Now we've come to the part where, Jeff, do you want to be this kind of person? <clears throat> What I appreciate about a lesson like this is it lays it out there. And I think Jesus is doing us a favor. I might add to somebody who may be hesitant here, because no matter what choice in life you choose, no matter what course you choose, there's going to be bumps in the road. There's going to be trials. I don't care if you're an atheist or an ag I don't care, agnostic. I don't care who you are. You're going to have persecutions, trials, things of these nature. Now, here the Bible, and here's what Jesus is doing, is doing us a huge favor. Here's what you can expect. Shame on those health and wealth gospel preachers that if you just have enough faith, you'll have no problems. Jesus very clearly in the beginning is saying, this is what you're in for. Are you ready to kind of man up or be mature about this? This is We're not going to trick you or deceive you into anything, but there's worth it here. There's a devotion that's worth it here. And so am I ready? Boy, I need to think about that. Let me sing the song, Are You Ready, about a thousand times. And uh, am I ready? To, that's that's what Jesus is doing here, and you've done it well. Lay it out there. This all right. Expect, well, yeah. I'm sorry, but the doorbell just rang. Let me let, let the lady who's come to clean this place of mine. And okay. Her in and I'll close it out. With just Sounds music. good. I wonder how long John will take. John always does a good job for us. I do like that verse 11 and 12. Persecuted for my namesake, not persecuted for being a jerk or unwise. That'll be in my next daily Bible verse entry, I think. Okay, John, thank you. I was keeping the audience entertained while you were away. So. Well, now you're ready to talk to the person as I have asked the question of you. Do you want to become... And note the word become and continue to become this kind of person. Even as I was going through this lesson and as we were talking about it, I, I think that often we become indicted again. I, just certain incidences of my life flash before my mind of where I had failed. Well, folks, that's the reality. We've all failed. That's why we keep going. That's why we're so grateful that there is mercy by forgiveness. And that's what we want to extend to the world. Uh, we're not preaching ourselves. We need to be good examples of what we're saying, of course, and not be hypocritical. But don't follow my imperfect, failed, and flawed life. Follow the master. Very good. Together, okay. we help one another. Follow him. Together. Don't so be a disciple of John Kilgore. Be a disciple of Jesus. There we go.
Got it. My goodness. Bro. Uh, I like to challenge John. I'm going to, if you don't mind, I'm going to ask you a kind of a well different question related to this topic because I little through. So say, say you have a chance to have someone in that that is converted. And what I often do is I'll say, we've been studying together for a while, but now the studying really begins. We want to ground you. It's not over yet. It's now just beginning. I have a list of topics I like to go through just to ground somebody that I think are sort of necessary or basics. Do you have something along those lines? What topics, what, what issues do you think are important for somebody who's brand new to Christianity that you think these are some issues they need to get grounded in? Well, I like to always help a person go through the Sermon on the Mount and look at the, what Jesus, you know, this is the Magna Carta of Christianity where Jesus, you know, lays it out here in more of an outline form. Mm -hmm. all principles from each of the sections <clears throat> of the Sermon on the Mount. Mm -hmm. now, in addition to that, uh, we we'll go back and usually, if I'm working with a person who is a Christian, where possibly some failing has knocked them off the beam or whatever, maybe it's become public, therefore they're seeking help. Uh, often, we need to, first of all, identify to the degree of specificity exactly what it is so that we can better deal with it from Scripture. Mm -hmm. But often humility will be an issue of some form, some form of pride. You know, I look at my own life and looking at areas where I failed. I try to help people to see, because I had to learn this. And this was my process. John, you knew better. So why did you do it anyway? Wow. You know, I can't plead ignorance. You know, I had Christian parents. I was taken to Bible study and heard sermons all my life. I grew up among Christians. I grew up around Bible students. And I was a good student in my youth. You know, some of my greatest failings, well, it is my greatest failing, have been areas where I just lack the humility and the, the willingness to yield. You know, you know, okay, it's not as serious, whatever. We need to help one another in that way. And I tell you what, working with young people has really helped me. Because if there's one thing I hate most of all is hypocrisy. And I don't want to be one. And I've had to deal with those questions. You know, you're going over a principle with the young boys and some of the older boys as well. And some of them have had the courage to ask, well, Mr. John, did you ever do that? Now, what am I going to do? I wish I, somebody told me not to do it. That's why I did it. And I'm here to do you the favor, like Solomon or like the writer of Ecclesiastes. Is, exactly. Right. <laughs> you know, what it does is it really confirms more yeah. yourself in order to repent. I like to go over repentance with them. That's another yep. topic. What is essential for repentance? Well, having guilt. You got to feel guilty for it. Truly, godly sorrow. Not sorry you got caught, but sorry you did it. Whether anybody knows about it or not, God knows it. So godly sorrow works repentance. But in order to truly repent, you got to know what you did was wrong, and you got to know what is right. Mm -hmm. And go toward doing then what is right. right. So helping people with that will help them go a long way. And then I like to emphasize a whole heart, pure in heart, a whole heart, fully committed. Haven't you seen we've been willing to sell out if we give just a modicum, just a little bit of spiritual interest? You know, attend church every now and then. 
Well, it's not that we're trying to get a perfect attendance record for the records of heaven, but people who are committed enjoy. I like to ask people, do you enjoy worship? Some you look forward to. Do you enjoy worship? Singing to God and to one another. Do you enjoy praying with your brothers and sisters? Do you enjoy a taking of the Lord's Supper and collectively giving? Do you enjoy a, a public and group study of scripture where you're all talking about the same thing? You and I both know that I really enjoy a, a conversational Bible class mm -hmm. where people are saying, yeah, let me give my thoughts on this, where we're sharing in scripture. Is any of that pleasurable to you, where you would want to do it? And if it is, you're going to be there. Mm -hmm. you're gonna, those are a few that immediately. That's come. it. That's good. I, I appreciate that list. You know, uh, let me say this and then we'll close this out. It's getting a little bit over time. It's fine. But my, um, I just, I put myself as somebody in the target audience, somebody unchurched coming into it, maybe as a young adult, adult, I do like to cover, I'll say what we do and why we do it. I don't want you to think, well, we just take a collection every first day of the week because this is what the church of Christ does. We sing without instruments because this is what the church of Christ does. I want to go through some of those things so you can know what we're doing and why we do it. And maybe talk about the benefit of it's not for our benefit. It really, well, it is for our benefit. It's, God doesn't need that, but this is how he's asked us to worship him. And this is what he's asked of us. And you can go through each one of those you're giving, singing, Lord's supper, all those things. And they are for our benefit. And here's why. And so there's a whole list of things there that I try to ground somebody in. Cause I don't want them to go out into the world. This is what the, the my new church, the church of Christ is what we do. And now it's a, denomination versus denomination your answers were more guiding and building somebody's heart and their faith and i think that's equally as good equally as important so i, I put you on the spot there you gave a good answer though so. I, don't know, I would offer this in your response i've come to like this phrase let's do what we know pleases god good. and how do we know it because he said it Right. Perfect. We may have questions about, well, maybe he does, maybe he doesn't. We really don't know. But just, just answer this question. Yeah. That please God. Do you know that it pleases him? And how do you know it pleases him? In the area I live in now with a lot of tulip loving Baptists. Yeah, I said that online. <laughs> Yeah, God told me two in the morning last night, this is what he wants. And so there's a whole nother issue. We're not going to go there right now, John, but that's welcome to the area I've moved to. But that's yeah. the way it goes. So anyway, John, I appreciate your time. Thank you so much. As always, it's always good to see you. Good to spend time with you. As always, I consider you a dear friend. I appreciate it. Uh, and bar as well. I love you, Jeff. Love likewise. Let's do it together. Likewise, very good. We'll do it again sometime, Lord willing. We'll see what happens in the future. Have a good day, John. Thanks for your time. We'll see you later. All right, bye. bye.